Okay, welcome to this talk. Uh, the speaker is, is Alessandro Amici, um, a good developer, I think. Yeah, <laughs> it's a friend. So uh, he will explain some stuff about PyTest, and so welcome. So this talk is about test-driven code search. And this is a, a rather new technique, not so new because someone already tried it a few years ago with Java. And the, but it's the first time that I see it applied to Python. The idea is pretty simple. Uh, what we want to, what, what we uh, produced, what, what we did was a very basic search engine it's a, a PyTest Nodev, it's a PyTest plugin that enables you searching for code in, inside your machine on uh, packages that you have installed on your local machine. The special uh, thing about this, the test-driven search is that you use a test as part of the search query. So you may use some uh, also metadata and try to uh, refine your search, but the core, at the core, uh, what you are looking for is uh, what you describe with, in, within a test. We call it a specification test. That is something that tries to specify a behavior or a feature without going too much into the details on how it is implemented. And once you run your search engine, you will get some search results. So this is a list of functions or classes or whatever object, actually, that pass the specification test. The documentation, the, the main, uh, the core of the tool is the PyTest Node.dev plugin, and uh, there you have the main documentation, but there are uh, a few other uh, there are a couple of other, of other tools that, you, that I will show during the, the, um, during the talk. Now, since this is something new, uh, at the beginning I organized this talk to be somehow theoretical, but then I, I completely rewrote it yesterday because I think uh, really uh, good examples make people understand much faster. So, how it works. Uh, do people here know Unix test, uh, PyTest and PyTest pictures? Who, who, who does? Okay. Now, basically, the, 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 base, the uh, base implementation uh, detail is that the, the plugin uh, provides a special fixture that's called candidate. And you need to use this picture when you write a test that you want to use to search for code. What will happen is that uh, the fixture will effectively parameterize your, your uh, test by passing it all the objects that it will uh, manage to find in your environment. So you, if you install 10 packages in, your virtual, in, your, in the virtual environment, together with PyTest, it will collect uh, all the objects, all the live objects in your standard library and in all the, the packages that you installed. Then, obviously, since this will be a parameterized test, the test will be run every uh, thousands of times, most probably, and once for every object, and the object will be passed, a reference to the object will be passed into the current data candidate variable. So you basically will uh, use this candidate as if it was your, the, the function that you are looking for, and then the search engine will just tell you which functions, uh, classes, or objects in general actually appear to behave exactly as you intended. So this is the, let's do our first search. Uh, you want to search for some kind of, of a function that has a, a feature. For example, let's search for a function that, given the name of an executable, returns the path to it. This is not 
just a nice example, this is actually the first uh, real, uh, real case that we have. We, need, we had exactly this uh, need, and we started searching for it on, on the web. We didn't like the results, and we say, okay, no, this is the perfect uh, test case, because it's something easy. It's easy to, uh, to uh, write a test for it, and maybe there is something somewhere in the in my environment already that does it. Obviously, uh, the, you could just uh, write something like uh, uh, a sub-process call to which and then parse the result, etc. That would be hacky and it would, will not uh, work on Windows, so it's not the, the best. So what is the specification test? I write a standard test function for PyTest. I use the candidate fixture. Then I, just as a, to, to, to have the test more readable, I, re, I uh, basically rename the candidate to which, which is more or less the, the idea that I'm looking at something that works like the which command in the, in the standard library. So the, then I assert the behavior that I expect. I, if I ask sh, the shell, I want to uh, the, my function, my, my, the function I'm looking for should return bin sh. And if I uh, pass it the string env, it should return usr bin env. These two are two very common uh, Unix commands and they are the one among the most tables because a lot of commands can may be in usr bin or in bin or is bin or but these two are the more common. So once I have written this, um, this test, I, read, I write it to, to a file, and then I just run it as uh, usual uh, with PyTest as usual. Just I need to add candidate from all. This means that the candidate function, the candidate fixture will be parameterized by everything I find in, the, in my environment. So this starts a standard test session, and I get usually something like 5,000, 6,000 uh, uh, objects. This depends very much on how many, uh, how many packages you have installed. This is not many. It's easy to go into the 30,000 or 50,000. And then it just run for a while, we will see in a minute. And since the test is expected to fail, it, the PyTest will print a small x when the, the test failed. I mean, you are throwing basically random functions to the test, so you expect it to fail most of the time. But then you have capital X's, which means that the test passed in, in it was not expected, but it passed. At the end of the run, you have many, many x. What you expect to do is to have a, a result, and in this case, we found three functions, three objects that pass the test. And this is the report. So for my test which uh, file, uh, we found a, a case in which, in which the test which function passed, and this is the executable. Now, I have the test function as well, and let's see how it works, how much time it takes. So right now, I'm not using uh, PyTest, pure PyTest. I'm using a kind of a, um, a boxed uh, run on Pytex inside, inside the Docker container because when you throw random arguments to random functions, anything can happen. So if you try to do it on your machine, you will find backup files for uh, crazy, with crazy names or probably uh, connections to wrong hosts or whatever. So you prefer to do it in Docker and at the end of the run, you throw away your Docker environment. So what happens is that right now it's collecting all the 
So all the objects, now the, I have a little bit less objects than when I did the test because I had blacklist, I blacklist objects all the time because they are, uh, they might crash your environment or, uh, or I don't know, open up a browser, etc. And this is what happens. Now the, all the tests, the, the, that test is running with all the functions. We see most small x, it means that it, we didn't find n much, but here we have one x. So this is one of the, we found at least one function that actually worked. This takes approximately 60 seconds, and if everything goes okay, and now we should f also have some garbage on the screen because uh, since you are using functions and classes in unexpected ways, you're always throwing random stuff to it, exactly, you end up discovering a lot of bugs and <laughs> in the package that you have because in m most of the, of the printouts is uh, exception in the Dell uh, method that are ignored but printed to the standard error. Well, I finished. So this is the, now what happens once you get the result? You say, okay, I have tested past that very easy, very basic test. And what do I do? Well, since I have uh, a manageable number of, of results, I can just have a look at them and decide if this is really what I want. This is the, sorry, the distutil spawn find executable. The name looks like it, what we are interested in. And this is inside the standard library. So it's very, it's very useful. Maybe I don't need to write any code for my, for my find, ex, find executable, uh, for my which function, because I may just use this one. You see, it does more or less what I thought. Uh, it gets path, then it splits somehow in an OS independent way, then it, make, it does some Win32 checks that I even didn't think I needed because I don't use Win, uh, Windows usually, but yes, might be useful. And then it just tries to see if the, if, um, the file exists inside the path. It's not really the best. I mean, is file, it doesn't check if the file is an executable. So it's not really perfect, but at least I have a template if I want to improve on that. Then I have p expect util switch. I don't care too much about that because I already have a function in the standard library, so I don't need to add a dependency to my project if I want to use that. But then they have SHD which, whoa, this is even more standard in the standard library, and this is the code, and if you have the look at the code, it's much, much more complex, and it has a real access check, that means it checks that you can read it, that you can read the file, and you can execute it, and does several uh, details that I would not have thought I would not I would it would have taken me one year of production to get right. So very nice. Unfortunately, if you go to the, into documentation, you learn that this is only a Python three only actually Python three point three. So if your code, if the, the, the your use case needed to work in Python two and three, you might can get to uh, a very nice find executable. It's still in the standard library. It's not as nice, but okay. Or maybe you can just take it as template and get it better. Or if you are Python 3 only, you have the luxury to use which, which is great. Well, uh, how many of you already know the which function or how to solve this problem? Okay, a few, right? I mean, it's in the standard library, but I mean, I didn't know it and it was faster this way than to, to to look for it. Okay, let's go back. Now this is a, 
a very simple uh, example, uh, but it also shows uh, how things work. Now, the, um, one of the points is that in this case, input and output of the function were really easy. Uh, when you have something that uh, where the reasonable implementation is really easy, it's uh, easy to write a test, but as soon as you look for more complex stuff, writing a test that doesn't uh, uh, that, that is somehow implementation agnostic, that doesn't make too many assumptions of the implementation is complicated. It's more complicated. But actually, Python is really great to write stuff that it's not too tied to the implementation, to the details of the implementation. Because it has dynamic nature. For example, using duct typing, you are not uh, forced to guess the right, uh, the right uh, 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 data type. The in operator is extremely powerful, and a lot of classes even work uh, nicely with the in operator. That is, instead of looking if the, 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 the result of your function is a list, uh, and the first element of a list uh, is what you were looking for, you just use the in operator to see if somewhere inside your function, inside your result, there is what you expected it to be. And then there are, you may write specific helper in particular, uh, we wrote the node app specs that helps you, that leverages the uh, uh, inspect module to go even deeper into the search of uh, where if the, your result actually contains the, what you expected it to contain, even if in crazy ways. So, Let's see how you would write a, a specification test in a way that, is, uh, that tries to be more independent on, from the implementation. Here, I want to parse an RFC 3986 uh, URI. Uh, this is also a real, a, a real test, a real case. And so I use the candidate fixture. I just rename it for, uh, for so I read it nicer. I uh, use a test uh, URI. And then I get my, all the functions that I will get will be past this URI, and I expect it to uh, return some kind of tokens. And then here, I will check if the schema and the path that I put in my URI are correctly parsed. Now, since most, uh, there are a lot of uh, false positive uh, if you, that are just uh, strings, I mean, just function that return the same string as the input, I check that the return of my functions is not a string. I don't care. Uh, I, I really want the string to be into, divided into tokens, so I don't want one string. I want some kind of list of strings. So let's see how, how it goes. This is the naive implementation in the sense that I didn't use any, um, uh, any special trick except Python standard uh, in operator, that is overloading, etc. Now this is going to run, come on. And usually I have uh, different command lines that can be passed and those mostly needs to restrict the search space if you already know that some part of, the, of your, of some packages are not useful. You want to restrict the search space so it, you get faster. But uh, this one, candidates from all, it's the more powerful. It's just search for everything and anything in your environment. So this is where, ho oh, oh. Obviously, I tested just before the, uh, I don't know, let's see, I have a second run. No, 
now let's see, since it's, it takes a little bit of time to run, I'll, I also tried a second, the second example that is the same, uh, the same parsing function that is instead uh, tested, the test is written using some uh, advanced functionalities. That is flag container, in other specs generic, is uh, it gets an object and it make, it's a proxy object that when you use the in function, it tries really hard to see if the, the item that you're looking for is somewhere in the object. So for example, it looks for into the uh, attributes, into the properties. Uh, it, it's, even if it's an iterable, it looks inside every, um, every item inside the iterable. So it's extremely thorough. Let's see if we manage to not get the queue. So, okay, apparently they're both running. So, on this screen, I have the naive uh, test, that one that trashed before. It was some kind of risk condition because it's going okay now. And now let's see what the results are. Okay. I got several results. Now, the first three results in collections doesn't look very good because keys view, chain map, user string really look like uh, false positive. That is, they're not trying to do anything with RFC or URL parsing, but it's just they're packaging somehow the string that you are giving them. But then you, are, you have this RFC3986 API URI reference that looks very nice. But also the URL parse, URL parse. That means you hit uh, functions that are able to do this both in a package and also in the standard library. Now, what is interesting? is that in both cases, both URL, the URL parse inside the RFC 3988 package, and also the one in the standard library, they don't return lists. They return classes. So how exactly this worked with a class? The point is that a lot of people are quite smart, and they give you some way to get to access stuff or to test stuff in an implementation independent way. That is, the, the two implementation that they used actually uh, provide a underscore underscore contains underscore underscore uh, method that tests exactly if uh, they manage to find pieces uh, that test exactly like a string, like a, a sorry, a tuple or a list. So it, it's not a simple type but it's a class that behaves like a type. Very nice. So you can happily use this one for most of, the, of, your, of your need, but if you need more features, if you, you may explore the code and you see, this special uh, package has more features. For example, it's able to recognize the username, which uh, the standard library function doesn't. Now there is something even more interesting. The other test, that one that uses a dedicated uh, proxy object to do the containment test, has found one more, one more object that matches. And this is a class in pip in the pip product that actually does the right thing but doesn't provide the, the nice containment uh, helper functionality. So we managed to get it as well because the helper function tried to very hard to, to find if the Postgres and the path, the schema and the path were inside the class. So. So 
this is a way to get to test results in an uh, implementation-independent way. But then I want also to pass arguments in the in, uh, independent way, in the implementation-independent way. So in this case, what helps me is the parameterized, fixed, the parameterized marker of PyTest. For example, I, in, in this case, I'm looking for a, a, a function that just removes comments from uh, a, a stream. And the main point is how do I represent the stream? Because uh, this is my text, and this is the readout of, the, of my configuration file, for example, and I want to strip this comment here. So how do I do? I use a parameterized, par um, a parameterized parameter argument so that I can say, okay, I have different functions that will make this text, this uh, comment, into different shapes. I can pass it as it is. As I can pass it as a uh, list of individual lines. Or I can pass it as a list of individual lines with numbers. This is uh, how my application actually was doing this, this part. Or I can pass it as a file. Now. In this case, since uh, I have a lot of uh, parameters, uh, I will run not just 5,000 times, but this will run 20,000 times. So uh, I prefer to restrict my, uh, my search ju by just including any, uh, any function whose name matches this uh, uh, regular expression. So I want something that has to do with comments. This makes everything much, much faster. And here it is. So I find a ignore comments uh, function in pip. Very good, because pip is something that I might assume it's a light dependency. And this tells me that the text to stream that passed is the third one. So I go back here. It's zero, one, two. So it's, this is the way, which was exactly the way I preferred. I could have worked with all the other trees, but this, this means that I don't even need to change my application to, to use that function. So by the way, extremely fast. This is the ignore comments. It's very simple, and it has also the feature that skips the line if it's empty. And this is the reason it also returns the line number, because it doesn't return all the lines that you pass. And look at the other function just below. This function takes options, which is a special class. And this class must have the skip requirements regex, otherwise it crashes. Oh God, even if I needed this, I would never ever manage to pass the correct, uh, the correct parameters to it because these parameters is extremely tied to the implementation. So I do tests that are quite loosely coupled with the implementation. I try to be as implementation agnostic as possible, but I only find uh, functions, callables, or uh, classes that are, that are, are, are good code, but if they are not, they don't uh, mix implementation details uselessly. You, you could just have you skip this skip requirements regex could just have been a keyword argument with the same default. And the function would be as useful and I would have been able to uh, search for it or to use it in general. So, when you search, you may either get only relevant results, which means your query is just perfect, or you have to refine your query. So if you don't get any results so at all, which happens quite often, it means that your test is too strict, and you probably need to remove test case, uh, edge cases, or probably just use a lower number of normal cases. If you find a lot of results, but they are not relevant, it means that your test is not it's too weak, it's not strict enough, so you need to add more cases, more uh, describe your feature better, and probably add more corner cases. 
if you see if you appear to go to from no result at all to no relevant result and back it means that you don't find anything you most probably uh, are looking for a function that is not in your environment now the this is the base of uh, uh, code uh, uh, test driven reuse which is something that started as uh, have been studied a little bit uh, in the in the in the Java community, and uh, the idea is to use of test driven reuse is just that you start like test driven development, you t you start your test. Maybe you try to write it in a more independent way than just uh, than you would do if you uh, already know what is the implementation that you are doing, and then you try to search if you find a function that already works. Uh, if any code, if any function passes your test, then you have three options. So if you don't find any function, it's test driven development. You have to develop it. So fine. Otherwise, you may just import it. That means you get the dependency, and or you may fork it. That is, you get exactly the same code, test, you check the license, and copy into your project. Or you may just have a look at it to see how many details you didn't think. Already. Another trick is that you may just use the test driven code search, which is a tool by itself for unit test validation. You, if you wrote a test, you think it's a good test, then you uh, make, it, make a search with it, and you find a couple of totally unrelated functions. It means that your test is too weak. It finds fa false. Uh, uh, um, false hit. So limitation of future work. The main po po point right now is performance. And then you may do a lot of things like uh, uh, extending the search space and uh, making more, uh, um, making uh, more tools. But then you get even more work to do. And so performance, 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 and parallelization, et cetera. And it would be very nice if this was not done on your machine, but on the web. So what we are trying to do is to uh, make kind of a search, uh, search engine on the web if you want to know when things are starting to roll, uh, write an email to the, to the email here, and we are looking for people who are willing to test. Conclusions. Uh, if you start using it, you will recognize much better what are good tests and what are good code, and you will tend, at least this is what we notice, we tend to write, to, uh, write your code so that all the implementation details are, are filed as way as possible, as simple, or as intuitive as possible. Thank you for your attention. Okay, do you have any question for the okay. Um, so do you filter uh, somehow already on for example the number of arguments that can be passed and similar things? Because if a function doesn't take any argument and you need something that takes one, then there's not a valid candidate, for example. I didn't understand. The, to when, you, when you look for candidates of yep. things that solve your problem, do mm -hmm. you filter already on the things that you've done? Right now, no. This is one of the reasons a, a, a web search, I mean, a curated uh, index of objects would be nice, but it's very difficult to do it on your machine. I mean, it's, with Python, it's, you may tell how many uh, arguments you are in a function, but not much more because you uh, do typing, you might not actually uh, want to be too strict. So the idea, the, the, the idea behind having a web uh, search engine is that you have a curated index of what kind of function may fit a particular test or not. Is there anything for timing out functions that could take a long time? Uh, this is already taken, taken into account. Every test has a timeout of one second. So a lot of the 
stuff that are tried our timeout, so you, I use prompt, uh, uh, row input, or et cetera, doesn't give any problem. The only, the real problem is when uh, you call uh, C extensions and they just crash the interpreter. I have a long list of, uh, I have a long blacklist for this kind of things. Another question? Yeah, no? Ah, see. So how do you deal with uh, multi-argument functions where I don't know what the order of the arguments is going to be and what's the time complexity of that? Okay, so this is what he in the first line, in the first row tried to do at the beginning. There is an automatic permutation of arguments. Um, I, I refuse that uh, because uh, right now to get correct, it's more important than to enlarge the search space. But as I was writing this talk, I noticed that you can easily uh, use the parameter, you can easily parameterize your function just switching arguments. So it's, it can be done right now with the, by just passing a parameterized with switching. And the complexity, it's very hard. If you have two, uh, two arguments, it's two, but then it's uh, n factorial. So with four arguments, you are already very, very heavy. And it's very easy to go into the hundreds of thousands of tests. Now it was really a small environment and for in, uh, educational purposes, et cetera. Grazie mille per tutto. Alla prossima. Thank you.